Hey, what is up, everybody? So a changing landscape in the photography world is nothing new. Bankruptcies, mergers, acquisitions, you know, who is really Kodak now? Who is really Polaroid? All interesting subjects to explore. You know, Sony buying Minolta's business, camera business, and kind of rising out of that. But I don't think anybody saw this Nikon acquisition of red cameras coming. So this was just out of the, seemed out of the blue, like a really big bombshell. A lot of interesting nuances to it. That is why everybody is talking about it. You know, Nikon and red were just in court. You know, red had just sued Nikon. You know, Nikon is kind of back from the brink that they've been on for a while and stuff like that. So just, you know, the RF mount on red cameras, you know, Red cameras, basically a lot of them taking Canon lenses, you know, Nikon's historic rival. So there's just so many things that are interesting and this is why everyone's talking about it. Um, all we really have though is the two press releases from the companies so far and then just a lot of speculation on what's gonna go on. But I think the thing that is illustrated to see what we think Nikon will be doing with Red is to look back and see where, you know, everything kind of came from. So I'm gonna go like pretty far back actually and you know, Nikon really made their name with the manual focus SLR, this is an F2 here. And in the late 60s, you know, the Vietnam War and everything that was going on in the 60s, this just kind of became the pro photographer um, who was gonna use an SLR. This was the choice camera. They're just tanks, it's a modular system. You know, you could change the focusing screens, um, just all kinds of stuff. So it was just really the choice. And you know, Nikon built on that legacy with the F3 or the 80s camera, which I think is the greatest uh, manual focus SLR, film SLR ever made, you know, F4, F5, F6, you know, so all their amazing film cameras that were just kind of the pro's choice. You know, Canon was making professional cameras too that were modular and professional systems. And as we got into the digital age, the two companies just really became the rivals. And, you know, Nikon would put out a flagship cam camera that was the best camera that was ever made. And then the next Canon camera would top it with certain specs. And it was just this back and forth. It was great for the high-end photography industry because the two companies were just completely leading the digital SLR innovation, you know, were, you know, getting into then 35 millimeter size sensors and stuff like that. The thing that was happening though is Canon was starting to really, you know, push into video with the 5D Mark II being like kind of the first SLR that was really video capable and people really used for that purpose. And then at the high end, their, you know, 1D line really getting into video. Of course, Nikon was adding that stuff too, but just not to the level. Um, so Canon just had this like, leg up in the video world in the hybrid shooting that was, you know, the reality we really live in now. My cat just climbed one of my sound panels and knocked it over. <laughs> so into this world comes Sony. Um, Sony had been trying really unique, innovative stuff for a while, and then just really kind of went all in on their mirrorless stuff. And as they started going in on mirrorless, they even started getting into the sports market with some of their later cameras and lenses and things like that. And I just think, um, Canon and Nikon were both caught a little off guard with how quick this change over to mirrorless would go. The one advantage that Canon had had though, and I think a lot of people really missed this, is that the 5D Mark IV and their latest 1D line had all these mirrorless capabilities. The mirror flipped up out of the way. They had the good tracking autofocus and the video capabilities. I know people really knocked the 5D4 for its 4K um, codex, but really it was a 4K hybrid camera. And when the mirror up was out of the way, it was a really good one. I know, cause I used it for three years. All the reviews said it was this minor upgrade and I just completely disagree. And also at the time, you know, everyone on YouTube and in reviews really seemed to care about 4K. I didn't have a single client who wanted files that big. So I was never shooting that camera in 4K, just very, very rarely. So Canon already had this leg up, I think, into the mirrorless world. Cause when they dropped the camera, I'm shooting on right now, the R5, everyone was like stunned that Canon could do this so quick. I just think they missed the fact that Canon had already been doing it. And so had Nikon to an extent, but obviously just not as much, you know, Canon with the cinema line again and stuff like that. And Sony also having their cinema cameras just really, you know, were thought of as also video cameras where Nikon wasn't. Nikon moved into the mirrorless world a little late. Their autofocus just really couldn't compete with what Sony was doing and then how quick Canon advanced with their autofocus. And they were really, really down. Um, Nikon had like 3% mar market share for a while in their field. And then they dropped the Z9, which is just an incredible 
high-end flagship camera for a decent price for what those kind of cameras are. And with the video features that everyone wanted and upping the autofocus almost to the Canon and like at the Canon and Sony level. I haven't used one every, but all the reviews kind of say this is definitely workable. And then they came out with the Z8, the more affordable version of the Z9. Amazing thing about the Z9, no mechanical shutter. So Nikon really kind of took a risk because a lot of pros don't like change. Um, but they were the kind of the first to drop that with their really fast stack sensor. And everything I've seen, it really holds up. Nikon is now almost up to 13% market share. So just a dramatic shift. I say all this just to say like Nikon really, a lot of us were thinking this camera, this camera brand, this storied camera brand is heading to bankruptcy. Like this, there, I just didn't think Nikon was gonna exist anymore. And I'm not the only one who felt like that. You know, so now I think their tech from these two top end cameras is just gonna contribute continue to trickle down to the Z6s and the Z7s when the third versions come out, which everyone is, seems to be looking forward to. So yeah, that's the landscape we're in where Nikon has just come back from the brink and then announces this acquisition of RED. Again, one of the huge things that is interesting about that is RED had just taken the Nikon to court. So some of those video features that are really good on the Z9 are that it can internally record RAW and compress it. Well, RED owns all these well, owns his main patent on compressed internal raw. Um, most people are in agreement that this patent was granted way too wide reaching, where, you know, if it had been very specific to the algorithm they were using or something like that, it would make a little more sense. But basically, Red has been going after anyone who does anything like this. So Nikon, I think, a lot of people the, seems to think they kind of flaunted it and knew they were going to get sued and were going to be like, we're going to challenge this whole idea. And they did, and the two companies settled not too long ago um, and just made an agreement. So one thing that's been going on is Canon cinema cameras have been doing this, but the reason people believe is they're trading uh, RED, because RED uses Canon's RF mount on, a, on, what, two of their main cameras. So everyone's like, okay, Canon allows RED to use the RF mount because Canon has all these great lenses, then Canon could get away with using this compressed RAW formats and stuff like that. So now with Nikon owning RED or, you know, Basically, the press releases are an intent to buy red. There doesn't seem like there's going to be anything that would stop that, but you know, they are very different markets, very different sized companies. So it'll just be really interesting. That's one of the first things. Everything I'm reading, everyone's like, well, why would they stop them from using that? And I'm like, because they're huge rivals, you know? Why would Nikon want to be selling something that's gonna to lead to the sales of Canon lenses? So I don't believe in the long term they will stick with the RF mount. A lot of people are saying, well, Nikon doesn't have cinema lenses and that's an issue. There's third party lenses for Nikon Z mount, so that's one thing. But also with the Z8 and the Z9 being capable, you know, video machines, I just feel like I bet they have a bunch of this kind of stuff in the works, these kind of lenses in the works to be able to, you know, put on red cameras eventually. So there must have been some kind of calculation already going on at Nikon that they need to expand this kind of element of their business. So one with the lenses, two, instead of trying to build a cinema camera company when they just have no real history in the bigger cameras, you know, like Sony has their FX3, their FX9, and then their Venice system and stuff like that. You know, Canon has their full cinema line, the C lines and stuff like that. So that's one of the really interesting things about this is, you know, the lens mount thing. Also, so RED makes money off of, you know, people licensing their technology and the codecs and stuff like that. Being that Nikon just challenged that, would Nikon then go and start suing other companies that were doing this? That would seem to be extremely hypocritical and seem, seem to be extremely weird. Um, people are saying that, you know, Nikon's just gonna let RED run how it is. We, no one really knows how profitable RED is. From what I could understand, I tried to find everything, but RED is not publicly traded. Um, the one stat that just kept coming up is that RED's cameras were used in 25% of the top 100 grossing uh, movies last year. That number really just doesn't mean anything because, well, and especially to me, and maybe someone knows more, but how many of these cameras are rented? How many of these movies have the same film crews? I have no idea on any of that stuff. But obviously that's a high end when you look at like what Nikon must be selling in Z8s and Z9s and 6s, 7s, and 5s. has to just dwarf what RED is doing. So to me, the whole deal must more be about the technology. One, Nikon getting a leg in higher end cinema cameras, but two, you know, 
Red has these global shutters that are extremely capable, and Sony's the only, you know, like of the hybrid companies to put a global shutter into a hybrid camera. And it does have some weaknesses with dynamic range and stuff like that, where Red is claiming their sensors don't have these weaknesses. So Nikon being the company that's already got rid of the mechanical shutter and two cameras and has these super fast stack sensors, I think that they're looking at combining that kind of technology. They have to be. And from Red's point of view, They've been trying to make some smaller cinema cameras and you look at Sony, people are shooting stuff on those small FX3s. I've used the FX3 on gigs doing camera operator jobs and they're great cameras. So I think also maybe Nikon's you know, ability to market and sell smaller cameras is also something that would be appealing to Red and that might be where the crossover is. You know, Red's a company that was founded in 2005. They don't make lenses anymore. They probably don't build their sensors, but they do probably do a lot of the research and optimization to whoever is building their sensors for them. So it's just really unique and Red being, yeah, a California company, you know, Nikon being an old school giant, um, Japanese camera company. Just curious what other people think. This is kind of my perspective. I really think this is Nikon wanting the technology and a little leg in the cinema market, but I think it's more about bringing a lot of red technology to Nikon cameras. Um, who knows? It'd be really interesting to see um, what the profitability and what red's numbers look like, just, but I still just don't think that is the key issue that is going on here. So yeah, this is just gonna be a really interesting topic to keep following as it develops and as we get more information and then as stuff starts to happen, which should be, you know, a fair way down the road. But I don't know, let me know what you guys think about this. What is your speculation? Why did Nikon buy red? Um, what is their goal? And I will see you in the next video.